Okay, so today we're going to cover DNS and then we're going to wrap up the networking section with um, the content distribution networks. Uh, and by the end of this sort of sprint through the network protocols, you'll have at least the general topic areas of what you would need to understand very deeply to do a solutions architect kind of cloud certification. Uh, this is like taking a site and then just deploying it in the cloud and allowing it to scale. Uh, these are all the different kinds of skills uh, that you would need uh, for that kind of position. Uh, so the last piece of this is DNS. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so the DNS name system, uh, a lot of the internet uh, routers and machines like to use binary numbers. Uh, so. Uh, it's no surprise that the addresses that were used for network addresses were numbers. Uh, fixed length addresses, uh, 32 bits, uh, as we saw earlier with the IP address. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, people don't like numbers. We can't remember our own phone numbers sometimes. Uh, so we like variable length names. Uh, or, uh, so www.cs.pdx.edu, easy to remember. Back in the day when uh, AOL was really popular, America Online, as this uh, ISP service. They used to do something called keywords. Like, you give me a keyword and I'll give you a page of content that's associated with that keyword. That was another naming system for a collection of resources. Uh, so, uh, DNS keywords and naming protocols, all they're doing is mapping a name uh, to an address. Uh, initially, it used to be a single flat file. We used to have a file, etsyhosts.txt. Uh, SRI kept the main copy, and then every morning you would come in and you would download the new copy. And then you would see all the new internet hosts that were available for you this day. Uh, and then you could go visit them. And so, uh, so this didn't scale, obviously. Uh, and this was in the uh, late, uh, no, early 80s. Uh, the count of the number of hosts was increasing. Uh, the number of uh, domains per machine or per user started to increase. So many more downloads, many more updates to host.txt. So that ended up uh, being unscalable. So they decided in, in 1984, well, before 1984, it just got standardized in 1984, uh, to build a naming system. And as it turns out, they wanted to build this. So the hourglass design, you know, keep the network really simple they decided to implement the naming service on the edge. So as an application layer protocol, you're providing core internet service, a name to IP address mapping at the edge. Uh, and that's what they decided to come up with. So uh, this system, it's a distributed database for implementing this name mapping. Um, and it's implemented in, an, in a hierarchy uh, in order to get this scalability and distribution of operation. Okay, so the goals, uh, they want it to be scalable, they want it to be uh, decentrally, decentralized, they want it to have decentralized maintenance. You don't, they don't want, they didn't want like SRI to be the central bottleneck as to whether or not you could get a name. Like anybody should be able to get, well not anybody, a lot of people should be able to create names and then get a presence on the internet. So they didn't want uh, a gatekeeper uh, for this function had to be fault tolerance. It, the names, and this is important, they have to be globally scoped. And this is especially important today because there are a lot of people who are, uh, there's a lot of nations who would like to split off their own DNS because they don't like part of the internet. They don't like the, like maybe uh, the, the dot com, not the dot com. There's some, certain sketchy parts of the internet that are like, you know what, I don't want those names to even exist in my namespace. So I want to get rid of them. Uh, but initially, uh, the idea was that everybody who had a particular name would be able to map that to a particular address anywhere in the, in the, in the globe. Uh, and what you don't need is anything in your database class, if anyone's taking databases. You don't need atomicity. You don't need strong consistency. You don't care too much about transactional properties, which is what you would typically care about in a, in a traditional database class. So none of that stuff matters. Um, so they organized this namespace hierarchically, and uh, the hierarchy starts on the right and goes to the left. So the root is basically a, an implicit dot at the end of this name, and then you go to the edu, and then the edu builds a tree from there to get to PDX, 
uh, and it has all these other universities, and then from there you go to the CS subdomain, and then finally a, a particular host. So that's the hierarchical namespace they decided to, to use, and they wanted to implement this. They want to be able to have anybody in this, within this domain create a name, and then for the hierarchy to be, uh, to, to be able to look it up in the hierarchy. So the high-level view of DNS, there are two parts of this. There's the client side and the server side. Uh, the client side has two uh, things. It has a resolver, and this is typically on your end host. So this could be your operating system, or it could be actually your application itself, implements some resolving code. So it's the thing that gets the name. It says, okay, I have a name. I have to figure out what to do with it. Uh, I have some code in here, and part of that code will rely, uh, what's, what's in that code is, hey, uh, I might not know this mapping, but I, can, I know who to ask. So that's the job of the resolver. Some library on your client that figures out how to ask a question, and the a question gets asked to a local DNS server. We talked about this being delivered through DHCP. It's typically a single IP address that's listening on the domain port. So uh, it was on the Slack channel earlier. Hey, what is this dot domain? That do domain port is a local DNS server, typically, uh, listening on port 53. Uh, that's actually all the DNS servers that are listening on port 53. Okay, so this is on the client side. Uh, uh, so this might be running on your, on your laptop. And then you're pointing to a local DNS server, and this is the piece that can ask the questions to the hierarchy. So in this case, pdx.edu, we have like 131.252.208.53 as our local DNS server here. Uh, you could point it to Cloudflare's local DNS server, 1.1.1.1, if you want your uh, resolution to go down to the PIDIC block, or 8.8.8.8 .8 if you want it to go to the DALs. Somewhere typically local is where you would ask the question. Um, and then uh, this would point to, uh, this server would then point to the hierarchy the distributed database to be able to resolve that name. So it starts with the root name servers, and we'll talk about individual pieces in a minute, uh, and then goes to the top level domain uh, servers, and then finally to these authoritative name servers at the bottom. So that's the complete picture, and we're gonna pick apart uh, individual pieces of this. Okay, so the first thing is the client resolver. It's code on the client to query the DNS hierarchy. Uh, it's typically configured on Linux. It's configured using this, uh, this file. Um, so local name servers uh, are specified. This thing will specify where to pull the local name servers from. And then there's a file here, resolve.conf, that you can either hand configure or is automatically configured when DHCP runs. It says, what is my local name server? So I could hard code this to 1.1.1.1, which is what I've done on my machine. Uh, or you could just get it from DHCP. In fact, you could actually see what, what got configured uh, by DHCP uh, on your laptop. Uh, and then whenever your, your, uh, your browser or any, any uh, program on your computer has a name it wants to resolve, uh, it will just query, uh, uh, it will send a query to a local name server. Okay, uh, the, there is a resolver library that's resident on the operating system. Uh, but now a lot of the, this code is being just uh, baked right into the application. Uh, so uh, here are some examples. Google is, in, uh, in, is basically packaging all of this uh, up into a, a single app, and then Cloudflare is integrating itself into Firefox for very specific reasons, which I'll talk about at the very end. Okay, so uh, the local name server is going to take these queries from the uh, client, and then it will forward them in, it will either, if it has this lookup, so the, tip, the reason why you would have a local name server is that if this entire classroom goes to google.com, uh, the local name server can, can resolve that name once and then be done with it for the rest of the class. It doesn't have to forward that request into the hierarchy after the very first time it does it. So that's part of the reason why you would have, because you could, you know, you have a computer, you could actually have your machine query the hierarchy directly. The reason you would point it to 1.1.1.1 or the Portland State's uh, local DNS server is because we got a bunch of people here looking up the same, same names. So why don't we just go there, like mail.pdx.edu. I'm sure we only need one resolution in the morning, and then that's it. Like everybody can just like get that, that, uh, that mapping. Um, so you can either use uh, the uh, Portland State one, uh, typically a, an ISP, a company, or a university. 
has one that's running, or you can use any of the public ones. So I mentioned Google and Cloudflare. There's also OpenDNS. So if you're a parent and you like filtered access to, to the names that your kid like surfs, then they have a packaged managed service that says these domains are okay, they're you know kid friendly, and these domains aren't, and then you can block based on the name uh, lookup. So that's that's one of the things that OpenDNS provides. Uh, these local name servers, they don't belong to the hierarchy of name lookups. They're just software that knows how to query the hierarchy. So um, they're basically a proxy um, and a, a proxy cache. So hopefully there's some caching going on. Otherwise, it's just a proxy. Okay, so that's the client side. It's pretty simple. Are there any questions about that? Yeah. So you're saying you uh, try to configure it to work out one by one? Yeah, I do. Um, well, uh, it's not a performance reason, <laughs> just because I like, uh, well, it could be. I don't know who manages our local DNS server, um, but 1.1.1 is, is, you saw the latency on that thing. Um, I don't know. It's just, <laughs> if you don't, if you are suspicious of your workplace, maybe you're thinking that someone is monitoring all your DNS requests, then maybe you would choose. We'll talk about privacy issues with DNS, because all of these requests are done in the clear. Uh, everyone can see everyone else's DNS uh, requests uh, right now. OK, um, so one of the pieces of a local DNS server is that each one of these things has to know how to query the hierarchy. So there's a hierarchy that implements your distributed database. The thing that is there are 13 hard-coded IP addresses for all of the root name servers. So the root is at the top of the hierarchy. So if the local name server doesn't know a name resolution, it always starts at the root. To, it queries the root and then goes down from there to find the actual mapping. And this is a through m dot root servers dot net. Those are all the IP addresses that you can, you can pull. In fact, this is part of your lab where, where you're, you're digging around the, the DNS hierarchy to find stuff. Okay, so uh, I mentioned the hierarchy, uh, the naming hierarchy, starts at the root, goes to the top level domains, and then goes to the authoritative servers. Turns out the servers that implement this are organized exactly the same way. What a coincidence. Uh, so basically you have at the top, you have the root servers. If the client, uh, so say the local name server doesn't know what amazon.com is, then what the, uh, the client side will do is it will first query the root, uh, and it says, hey, you know, I want to find uh, the .com uh, TLD servers because I want to traverse the name from right to left to find the mapping. And when I get to the leaf, the leaf will know what that mapping is. So that's the first part. I query the root servers. The root servers are like, hey, you know, um, I don't have www.amazon.com, but I know what the whoops, I know what the .com TLD servers are. So I'll uh, I'll send you back the, the .com TLD servers, and then the client side will query uh, the .com TLD servers, and then the .com TLD servers say, you know, I don't know www.amazon.com, but I know the uh, amazon.com authoritative servers, and then finally you would query that, and then hopefully you would get the IP address back. So that is how a DNS lookup uh, operates uh, in the hierarchy. Is that clear? Okay. Uh, so the root name servers, these are 13 hard-coded IP addresses, and the, the history of that is that that was all that could fit in a 512-byte uh, octet uh, SOA record, which is the DNS uh, sort of uh, record size. So that's all that could fit. So that was, those are the roots. It's, it's contacted by the local name server. It's geographically distributed. And actually, they're doing similar things with these 13 IP addresses that Cloudflare is doing with their 1.1.1.1 address. They're trying to make each one of these things an AnyCast address effectively, just for scalability. Because at one point, these used to be 13 machines. And uh, one person, John Postel, owned like more than half of them. <laughs> and so he, he ran this sort of toy experiment to see whether or not the DNS was resilient or not. And he moved like half of the root servers over, and, and this is sort of where they were like, oh, there is a centralization point. The root servers for DNS are actually probably the most central point of failure uh, that the internet has, because it's just 13 locations you can DOS. And in fact, people have tried doing that 
you know, let's DOS the, the root servers to, to try and bring down the internet. That's actually happened before. Um, Let's see. And uh, one of the things about the root name servers is that they contain the author they contain a pointer to all of the authoritative name servers for the top level domains. So they are implementing this part of the hierarchy. So these three, for example, would all have authoritative entries at, on a root server. So they, they know this one level, uh, and then they rely on these servers to know the next level. So that's that's what this means. The, the authoritative server for the top-level domains are the ones that can, that can serve out top-level domain names. Okay. Uh, so this points to the TLDs, and these are responsible for all the mappings within each of the individual TLD domains. So uh, the com domain, the org, the net, the edu, and then all the country domains uh, would be TLDs that are hung off of the root server, uh, a root server. Uh, and then these are typically managed by companies or consortiums. So the COM uh, TLD is, is managed, used to be managed by Network Solutions. The EDU TLD is managed by EDUCAUSE. And these are organizations that control the allocation. They're like, oh, you know, uh, PDX.edu, that's already been taken. Uh, you can do something else, for example. So they would, they would mediate that. Uh, the bottom part are the authoritative name servers, and this implements the part of the data, uh, distributed database. Typically, the, the actual mapping that you want is issued by these authoritative name servers, uh, and it, this provides the IP address to, to name mapping for a domain. So, uh, in this case, uh, the pdx.edu uh, DNS server, uh, the, uh, the authoritative name server for our university, it will issue the names for things like media.pdx, d2l.pdx www, and then even mail.pdx.edu. All those are entries. Uh, OIT manages our name server somewhere on this campus, and then they'll, they'll do the, they'll hand out the mapping. You can actually, at, in the lab, you can dig around to find the IP address that's doing all of this stuff on Portland State, if you'd like, uh, as part of the tool set that you'll be using. Okay, so uh, this authoritative name server, it's, it's managed by, the organization, uh, in our case OIT, or you could actually have a service provider do all of the management for you. So for example, I have a domain, OregonCTF.org, and I don't like running uh, DNS servers uh, myself because it's like stuff to manage. So you, you, can, you can outsource the management of this to some service, so I do it by Google, so I go to domains.google.com, and then the entries are done via a website. And then they manage the DNS servers on the back end. And I'll show you an example of this. Um, uh, let me skip that. Um, OK, oh, well, actually, so um, it's important when you look at that tree, the, the, the tree, the, the level at the, at the top is basically the authority for the levels in the middle. And then the middles are authorities for the, the servers on the bottom, and then the bottom ones are authorities for that final name mapping. And so when you see uh, uh, the .edu TLD server, uh, this, is the, this server is an authority for .pdx.edu, so it's the next link, and then .pdx.edu is then the authority for the subdomain cs.pdx.edu. Uh, and these authority records are special records. They're special records in the hierarchy um, that we'll talk about their their type in a in a later slide. Uh, actually, this slide. So, so there are many different record types in DNS. These are the main ones that I wanted to cover. The A record is basically the default record. So at the very bottom of the hierarchy, you have a bunch of A records that say www.cs.pdx.edu is 131.252.2 something. Uh, dot 100. That is your, your, your leaf. This is the address record you were looking for. Um, if you want a separate mail server and you want, so for example, if I go to www.yahoo.com, it should be different than if I send someone an email at yahoo.com. That is done via a separate name record. So if you want to send someone mail at yahoo.com, you would look up their MX record. And you'll see in the domain tools that we uh, have, that I'm having you do for your lab, you can specify the record type so that you know the mail server is running on a different address than the website is. Typically, when you ask for the website address, you'll ask for the A record. 
uh, for that. So those are the those are two. Uh, there's another record called a C name. This is an alias. So if you want some name to map into another name, uh, that's what the C name is. Uh, the last one is what I wanted to uh, cover in terms of the authoritative server. So when I say something is an authority for another, uh, so for example, the root the root servers, they're like, hey, I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that name, Amazon.com, but I do, I am the authority for .com servers. I know where .com servers are. So I would have an NS record. This is the uh, um, specifying the authority for. This NS record says, uh, I am the authority for the next level, for that next level entry. So the root server has an NS record for the .com TLDs, and that would be stored in this NS record. So I don't actually have the address uh, for that mapping, but I do know who can serve you that name. And that's, that's the NS record. And uh, this is something that we'll do a demo of in your, in your lab as well. I have a bunch of commands for you to run to basically traverse the, the hierarchy using the different types of records that we have shown here. Okay, uh, the next thing I want to cover are ways to query the hierarchy. There are two ways. There's the recursive way and the iterative way. Uh, the recursive way set, asks a server to do a resolution and then forces that server to do it all before coming back. Uh, so you're basically, it's sort of like a blocking call, right? I want to block until you finish resolving the thing and then come back to me. And then it re either returns the answer or not found. And this leads to really heavy load. So typically you would not do recursive querying on the internet or on name servers. Uh, the other uh, query type is iterative, where the contacted server replies with the name of the server to contact next. So if it only has the next top of the hierarchy, it would just show you that. It would return that rather than try and query the hierarchy recursively in order to get a result back. Uh, so typically what we do uh, on the client, the client will, iter the, the I shouldn't say, when I say client, I should say the local DNS server typically iteratively queries the hierarchy because if you were to recursively call the root server, then the root server is sitting there managing your connection until the whole thing is resolved. And if everyone's hitting the, re the, the root server with a recursive query, it would fall over. So typically, the root server turns off recursion. Um, so here's an example of a recursive query. So I have a host here, and I want to look up OregonCTF.org. Uh, I will ask my local server, whoops. And then the local server, because it's a recursive query, it will uh, recursively query the root. And then the root will have to hold this connection and send off another connection to the .org, and then the .org has to send it off to uh, my, the Oregon CTF uh, authoritative server, and then finally I get this uh, thing back, and then, and then this goes along the recursive query, and then finally after this, the root can terminate my, the state on my connection, return the, the result, and then get it all the way back. So this builds a bottleneck chain through the root, which is what you don't want, so typically what happens is this iterative query. Uh, the requesting host will send a recursive query to the local DNS server, but then the local DNS server is going to do iterative queries to get the result. So here's what, what it looks like. Uh, so if I want OregonCTF.org, I will recursively query uh, my local DNS server. And then on behalf of me, the local DNS server is going to first query the root, say, hey, I need OregonCTF.org. Root goes, I don't know what this name is, but I know the .org part of this name. So on the way back, it says, you know, I am going to return you the NS record for .org. So I talked about the NS record previously. The authority for .org is this thing. And that is what the root servers have. They just have the authorities for the next level below, and we'll pass you that. Uh, and then given this answer, the local DNS server can now query the .org TLD, and that's what it does, and the .org TLD says, I don't know this name either, but I know the authority for OregonCTF.org, so that is what I'll return you. I'll return you the NS record for OregonCTF.org, and that'll be this thing, DNS1.OregonCTF.org. Uh, and then the local server will query uh, DNS1.OregonCTF.org, say, hey, give me this name, and of course, this authority knows the name, 
and passes back the, uh, the, the record. Uh, one of the things that you should note is that this name could resolve into multiple IP addresses. And we'll get to that when we talk to content, just talk about content distribution networks, that the naming can be, uh, uh, I guess, replicated. You can have replicated IP address addresses for a name. Okay. And then because this was a recursive query here on this link, uh, then the local DNS server will return the final result to the requesting host. So this is typically how DNS is done uh, in operation, in live operation. And you'll be emulating this using manual dig commands. Uh, it's a command line Linux tool for navigating uh, the hierarchy. Questions about DNS? All right. Uh, so DNS is a proxy that does some caching. So uh, responses are cached throughout the hierarchy for performance. Uh, and you will, you'll always want to reuse parts of the lookup uh, to decrease load on the naming system. Um, but you, you, you do want the state to time out. So you don't want the thing to be there forever because if I change my name mapping, I want it to eventually be updated, right? I don't want people to be using my, my uh, DNS mappings from like two weeks ago. Uh, typically when I change a name, I would like that to be updated within an hour. I would like everybody on the internet to get that change. And it turns out you can change the caching knobs on your DNS entry. There's a time to live uh, in a DNS entry and some people put it on the order of seconds. They're like, you know, forget about it. DNS requests are so low bandwidth. I want you to do a whole resolution every single time. Uh, and this is especially the case for content distribution networks. If you really want to shift load very quickly on your on your CDN, then you would want a very tiny TTL. Uh, but typically it's done on the order of hours, uh, these entries. Um, one of the things is that negative responses are also cached, so uh, any misspellings get cached in the hierarchy as being uh, non-existent, uh, the, dom the domain is non-existent. So here's an example of how uh, caching is done. Here's a lookup. Uh, so I have a client asking for www.cs.pdx.edu. It asks its local name server uh, for this. Uh, local name server queries the hierarchy. Uh, the hierarchy says, you know, I don't know any of these uh, parts, but I know uh, who can answer uh, this, this question. And eventually you'll, you'll get, hey, the authority for pdx.edu is over here. Uh, then you query, uh, then you cache this mapping. So now the local DNS server knows who the authority for pdx.edu is. So then it can ask uh, for www.cs.pdx.edu. And let's just say that pdx.edu doesn't control the mappings here uh, for cs.pdx.edu, but rather it has delegated cs.pdx.edu to a next level. So in this case, there are four levels. Uh, of the DNS hierarchy, uh, but then as part of this, now it has an authority for that next uh, pop of the hierarchy, so now it caches the authoritative server for cs.pdx.edu, and say our, our department has uh, its local DNS, uh, its authoritative DNS server for its domains, I don't think we do, but I actually cat, I think cat might manage this for us, like this is an OIT thing, and then this is, might be a cat thing. Uh, then I'll ask that server for the name mapping, and then it'll finally give me this final uh, address. And then I, can I will also cache that uh, here. So the A record for www is whatever IP address. So all of this stuff is cached, so that when I then have a subsequent query of mashimaro.cs.pdx.edu, I can actually go straight to the cs.pdx.edu DNS server and get that result. And so you'll see that uh, typically the DNS hierarchy is caching all the time so that you don't have to bomb the hierarchy with a bunch of requests. Okay, are there any questions about that? Yeah. Um, it's a holdover. So people have dropped the dub dub dub. Um, just because it's redundant, like a lot of people just use their regular name as their website. Um, but it used to not be that way. We used to have an FTP site, a website, and then a mail site. So we used to actually, you know, specify the website being dub dub dub. But more often than not, people will take dub 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 and then just map it back into just like OregonCTF.org. Like for me, they all point to the same thing. Like you could do dub dub dub, you could do OregonCTF.org. 
the, I, I have a wildcard thing that maps all of that stuff to a single uh, address, actually. And actually, this will be part of the DNS lab. Anything that doesn't match what I've predefined will go to the top level OregonCTF.org. So you can, man you can programmatically manage what your names mean. Uh, so uh, that's, that's part of, like, it, it's not necessarily, rather than it being a database that you're querying, you can actually be querying a program here that says, hey, if it, if it has dub, 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 or FTP, like, these are the two IP addresses, everything else, make it this IP address. So yeah, it's, but I guess from an abstraction level, you can think of it as a database. Are there any other questions about DNS? Yes. Uh, yeah, the, so security is done, and so when, so if you take the web security class, a lot of security is done by the name. And so you will see, if you haven't issued a certificate for the wildcard, then you might get a broken lock, right? Because, hey, you know, the certificate, when, I, when, when uh, Let's Encrypt issues a certificate, you're going to give it the name that it wants to mint the certificate for. If you want all of those things, if you're doing all of this remapping that I just talked about, like foo.organctf.org wants to go to organctf.org, you have to make sure that Let's Encrypt has signed the wildcard certificate on there. Uh, a lot of the web security, the browser security stuff is done by name. And a lot of the cookies, so cookies, uh, uh, same origin policy, TLS certificates, they're all done on names. And so if you messed up the names, then you could have a security problem uh, with cross-site scripting or, or these sorts of things. So that's a really complex uh, issue, which is why there's a whole course on web security. Yep. Yes, that's called a transfer, uh, and it's frowned upon. Usually administrators would do that for each other to like, hey, uh, I want to back up an entire database, so you would do a zone transfer. To get, but you know, this is a security problem because if I want to enumerate your backend, I want to know all the names so that I can maybe find the, the juiciest of targets on your backend. Then I would want your, I won't want your, I would want the the database that's here. And if I could enumerate that, or if I could get it from you, then yeah, uh, you have a, a nice surface area to to attack. Uh, and if you set up your, this is why I have Google managing my domains, because if you do it wrong, if you configure the thing poorly, then someone could ask for a zone transfer on your domain and get all your names, which, you know, in and of itself is not a security problem, but that just gives them targets to, to try and hit. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is the protocol. Uh, the, the only reason why I want to cover this is because uh, it's really simple. It can use TCP or UDP. And this is the format. It's got like number of questions, number of answers, uh, or, yeah, number of questions, number of answers, number of resource records for the authority, and additional resource records. It's got this identification field, and this is important. This is a 16-bit field that matches queries and responses. This is all done in the clear. So the, the, the DNS resolution is, is basically a UDP packet in the clear. Um, I, uh, Let's see, so what you're gonna do with your lab is to go on a Linux machine or your VM and uh, just take a look at how your DNS is configured. And then there's this command called dig and dig is basically a program that allows you to navigate the, the DNS system. Uh, so you could do this, I'm not gonna go through this right now, but uh, when you cat this file, you'll see what's your local DNS server. It could be your local host, maybe you run the DNS server locally on your own machine. It could be cat 131.252, it could be 1.1.1.1, whatever it is. It doesn't matter, they all do the same function. They all know how to query the hierarchy. Uh, when you type dig by itself, this lists the root servers. So this is the set of IP addresses that you query if you don't have a, uh, if you don't know a, a name that you're trying to look up. Uh, one of the root servers is, is the F root server. So you got the letters, it's, it's lettered A through M. So then what you can do is you can dig for the F root server because this is the IP address that you're going to start with, with your DNS query. So you'll get the IP address of the F root server and it's actually 192.5.5.241. And then you can say dig at this F root server, uh, do it iteratively because I don't want to 
because it would get denied if you, if you did it uh, recursively. Uh, and then use TCP. And the reason why I'm using TCP here is because if you do this uh, here at Portland State, we filter all of the UDP DNS requests. With, for good reason, but we like that, but just completely is eliminated. So if you're going to do this on campus, you have to add the TCP, otherwise this request won't work. And say you want to look for this name, and of course the root server doesn't know this name. So what it'll do is it'll give you the TLD for .com, and the TLD will say there's a bunch of entries for the TLD, the .com TLD. Let's just use uh, the L TLD, which is at this IP address. So then it gives you back this IP address to dig, and then you can get the next part of this. And it says, oh, uh, I don't have this name, but this, the fangs.com is served by Google domains. And so then you can do an iterative query on the, the Google domain that, 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 is the, that points to the authority to that. And then you can dig at that domain, and then you can finally get the entry. So this is an, this is an example of an iterative query down the hierarchy using the dig commands. OK. Uh, you can also just do uh, an iterative query on uh, uh, the local DNS server as well. Um, so hopefully, oh, so when you do this, because you haven't done the query through the local DNS server yet, this will actually be no entry because it, this was all done outside of the local DNS server. You're doing what the DN local DNS server would have done. So when you do this, it won't show up. But then if you do a dig plus recurse, the local DNS server is actually going to do what you just did up here, and then cache the result. So that when you do a dig plus no recurse again, you will actually get the result. Is the, that's what the last two commands were trying to uh, show. If someone else had done it before. This is assuming that nobody else had, had looked up uh, these two things. So typically, after these two commands, you do a no recurse, and then you would get the answer back. So no answer, because it's never seen this name before. Uh, answer, because you asked it to look up the name and then cache it. And then if you did this again, you would get the answer as a no recurse, because it's cached in the local DNS. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, go through. You're actually going to do something similar for your lab. So um, whether, it, whether or not you do this is, is I'm going to have you do this either way. So OK. Um, the other interesting thing about DNS are reverse lookups. So given an IP address, you would like to know the name associated with that IP address. That actually comes in handy. So if you're going through your uh, firewall logs and you see someone is trying to brute force SSH into you, you're like, where is that coming from? And this is what uh, people are doing. Like if, if I had a machine on campus that was doing a brute force SSH attack against some other target, then they need to be able to know who is the who is the network administrator of that block that is sourcing all of this traffic. And to do that, you need to be able to do a reverse lookup. So the opposite, IP address to name. And the way this is done are through routing registries. There is a special DNS uh, domain, in adder.arpa. And these are these implement these pointer record types. Uh, and this, uh, what the way this works is that if you reverse the IP address, so 66.220.250.131 is the reverse of Mashimaro, and then I add uh, dot in adder ARPA, and I'd say give me the reverse pointer of this name, it will actually give me the DNS name of the organization that owns that block, that IP address block. So this is really useful. They call this open source intelligence. So if you are trying to figure out who is attacking you, then open source intelligence is, is, is the thing that you're, you're doing to collect all the information about that actor. Um, so this is where you can start with, in terms of attribution. Like if you are being attacked and you have to, you, you're, you're responding to an incident, a security incident, and you have a bunch of IP addresses, this is one of the things that you would start doing to figure out, okay, where is this stuff coming from? Uh, like what nation state is trying to get me <laughs> is, is, is one of the questions. And so this is similar. So this is an alias for on the command line just doing dig dash x on the IP address. So I'll have you do this as part of your lab as well. And the way it works is that there is this regional internet registry that will implement this part of the hierarchy. And it works slightly different than the actual hierarchy that we talked about. Um, with every IP address range, 
when Aaron, this uh, internet registry, uh, allocates uh, ranges of IP addresses, it keeps track of the organization that it allocated it to. And then there's a database that it knows all of the people. So for it knows that it gave 131.252 to Portland State. And so that is the database that you are now querying when you do the reverse lookup. And so for uh, IP addresses that were given out by the US, uh, uh, Aaron is the thing that, that will respond to this, and then RIPE for the EU addresses. And so the registry forwards the, this request through these databases, and then you get as a result the DNS server of the organization that was given the range. So in this case, if you do this reverse lookup, you'll be given um, the address of this, uh, basically a, a name server, and then that name server will actually do the reverse lookup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can, they're legit. Yeah, they wouldn't lie. <laughs> well, part of this, they, we all sort of know as well. Like there's enough intelligence out there that, yeah, uh, it wouldn't make sense for them to, to lie because these are actually taxpayer, this is a taxpayer funded operation. And you know they have they have a job to make sure that this works, right? Uh, that this mapping works. And then typically, what would happen is there is a server in Portland State that will respond to reverse lookups. And uh, in this, the authoritative server for Portland State knows that that particular IP address is mashimaro.cs.pdx.edu. So that when you do a dig dot dash x of this, you'll see that name show up. Is the idea. So that, that comes in handy, actually, so that's why I wanted to show it to you. Um, note that I have mapped a whole bunch of names to mashimaro.cs.p. Like just about everything I run points back to this machine. It's on my, it's my desktop, and if it, my desktop ever fails, I'm going to have a problem. But everything maps to there, and the reverse lookup has no idea that I've done that. So some of these names, like you'll never get an OregonCTF.org showing up on a reverse lookup because it's actually mapped to the organization that got the IP address range. Similarly, if you do a reverse lookup on a Google IP address, it knows that it allocated it to Google, but Google is sitting here allocating all of that stuff to all of you. So when you create a DNS name and it's pointing to a Google IP address, they can't do a reverse lookup to find out that, yeah, uh, that's your name. So you'll be associating a name with a compute engine instance that won't ever show up in a reverse lookup. It's only those names that are directly allocated by the organization that received the, uh, the allocation. Are there questions about that? Um, so anyone, so I can put, uh, I can point a name to any IP address uh, on the internet. So this reverse lookup only works on that first level allocation, like, uh, like uh, Aaron, gave 131.252 to Portland State. So it has that in its database. That is the only thing that is funding, that is feeding this, this reverse lookup. So if I went to my uh, DNS server and then pointed a whole bunch of OregonCTF.org domains to, uh, to this IP address, uh, this, this facility has no idea that I've done so. Because the database that it's querying is this one hop it, the, is this registry here in Aaron, and the registry isn't involved when I point a name, just an arbitrary name. So it does need cooperation from the provider that has been given that prefix, is what I wanted to point out. Yeah. Yep. It would give you the PSU name for that IP address, is all that you would get back. I have 10 other names that I use this IP address to host a website for. None of those show up because it's the Portland, it's basically querying the Portland State reverse, uh, the naming system, yeah. Okay. So uh, you'll uh, eventually set up your own domain. Um, well, you'll be using a domain service to set up your own name. Um, but there are two ways of setting up your DNS. Uh, so if you wanna you know, create a company or a website or a blog, uh, you would register your name at a registrar, uh, such as like Google Domains. You say, I need that name. And then you would give the, reg there's, there's two things the registrar needs. It needs that, uh, the names and the IP addresses of your authoritative name server. So you recall, it just needs that one hop 
that goes to the authoritative name server and allows them to, to, to do that, to serve that iterative query of that hierarchy. So these are the two records that it asks for. Uh, you need to insert into the, the TLD, so for example, if this is organctf.org, within the .org TLD server, uh, it needs that organctf.org is the authority for that uh, domain name is this name, dns1.organctf.org, and then it needs an IP address that is associated with that so that it, it can respond to queries to that domain by saying, I don't know the name, but you can go to this person, 131, and say I'm using my own machine for a DNS server, and this is the A record. So this allows you to get the, the uh, traverse the hierarchy one level down. Um, and so you would then set up an authoritative server on this IP address, and then you would install uh, your own DNS server. In this case, uh, uh, the server you can install is bind. And then in this DNS server, you implement your database, you put an A record in for OregonCTF.org and an MX record in there, and then you're ready to go. And then you can set up, based on these records, you can set up web servers, you can set up email servers. So this is typically how you would establish a presence uh, on the internet. Uh, if you are lazy, like me, uh, you would just register the name and allow a, a provider to run your DNS. So here's an example of Google. I register this name, and then, you know what, I'm going to use Google to manage my name servers. Uh, I don't want to run my own, which is what the other button is. So the other button is what you would get in the previous slide, what you would have to do in the previous slide here. Uh, I just want uh, uh, Google to run it, and then Google is going to present me an interface. So I brought it up here. Google is going to pre present me an interface where then I can actually enter in uh, a record, so I can, I can, you know, type in a, a name and say, and give it the IP address, so you see all of these different names on OregonCTF.org. Uh, there are special domain names, the at and the star, these are wildcards uh, that you can specify, which I am not going to cover, but there are different ways of programmatically configuring your DNS, which is all part of uh, the DNS naming system. Okay. did have that there. I didn't need to do that. Okay, um, so there are some issues with DNS. Uh, the first issue is an amplification attack. Uh, so we mentioned that you can actually write your own IP address, uh, you can modify the source IP address of any UDP packet that you send to be someone else's IP address. So you did this in your NetSim uh, attack. You can actually do an attack that reflects off a DNS server and bomb someone else. So this is, uh, this is one issue with DNS. Uh, so the response, in fact, can be up to 65 kilobytes. So I can send a single 512-byte query that results in 65 kilobytes targeting a victim that I choose. So that's one problem. Um, uh, and this is one of the reasons why UDP is filtered. Uh, UDP, DNS over UDP is filtered uh, to eliminate this. Because with TCP, you require a full handshake before the DNS query is given. And that actually helps uh, prevent this kind of attack. Uh, a more nefarious attack is DNS cache poisoning. Um, there is very minimal authentication being done on DNS responses. So I fire off that request. The only thing that I keep track of is that identifier field, that 16-bit identifier field in the request. And then for a response, I am looking for the exact same identifier field for the answer. But if you're on an open wireless network and someone sees that request going through in the clear, well then they can be the DNS server and respond with a response with that same identifier field that says, that name is actually me. I want all your traffic. And then they can route your DNS requests. I could be your Google. If I respond to all of your DNS requests asking for Google, I could, I could basically get that. Uh, the other thing is that the, DN the adversary can attack the DNS servers themselves. So that hierarchy, all of those links in the hierarchy can be attacked. And if I can get your, your query through the hierarchy to go somewhere else, 
and respond using my malicious entries, I can hijack your, your DNS request. So uh, this is basically what happened to my Ether wallet last year. So my Ether wallet is, let's say claim, uh, Ethereum's original wallet. So this is the thing that people are using to store all their cryptocurrency. Uh, and of course, it's got a lot of dollars associated with it. So this is a huge target. As soon as anyone puts a wallet and puts it on the internet, for sure it's going to get attacked, and it, it sure did. So this was a cryptocurrency threat uh, theft uh, that exploited basically DNS. Uh, and this is what happened. So this is in conjunction with that BGP spoofing attack that I also mentioned. What they did was they decided that uh, the DNS for my Ether wallet my Ether wallet was using Amazon's uh, Route 53. So that was their hosted DNS service on AWS is called Route 53. And so what they decided to do is they, you know, I'm just going to hijack all the name. Anyone using uh, AWS Route 53, I'm going to hijack all their queries. And that's a lot of people, right? A lot of people are using AWS to host their names. I'm using Google, but like you could do the same thing on Google if you wanted to. Um, and then the adversary was just going to, they uh, advertised a whole bunch of slash 24s that they knew Route 53 was using. And because these were more specific routes than the original AWS uh, route that was being advertised, they were able to route all the DNS traffic to themselves. Actually, there's someone in Russia. So this was, actually, this was attributed to Russia, I think. Uh, do I have that there? Yeah, so it was, it was Russia, and they set up fake web servers. They set up fake My Ether Wallet. What they scraped the My Ether Wallet website, and they popped up their own, and then they redirected the DNS to go to these fake ones. Now the problem is, is that they didn't get certificates issued for their fake site, and so this is something. If they had used Let's Encrypt, they own the name, they have the IP address, they could have gotten the certificate. And because a lot of users saw that the green lock was missing, or the, there was something wrong with the connection, uh, this basically, uh, oh, there was only, so I forget the statistics of this. This was like maybe, it was less than 20% of the people who went to this site entered in their credentials, which is why they only got 150,000 out of it. Uh, so yeah. So if they would have used Let's Encrypt, then that, they would have gotten millions of dollars, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, at this point. So this is just uh, an example of how all the pieces that you're learning about can be used uh, either for you or against you, I guess, uh, against you in this case. Okay, so uh, I want to go through a little bit of what uh, DNS cache poisoning looks like. This is the typical operation that you just have seen. Um, you, have a, you have a machine, your machine has a resolver, asks the local DNS server for something. Local DNS server eventually gets to Amazon Route 53 that passes back the uh, IP address, and then you go to MyEther wallet, and that's fine. Uh, this is what actually happened. You ask the resolver, the resolver asks the, uh, the hierarchy, and then eventually, because you have redirected the BGP route, that you go to the attacker's authoritative server, and the attacker basically passes you back something different. Yes? No, no, the web address is exactly the same. Uh, so then you would just need the username and password of, of the account or something, and then you could use that against my, the legitimate my Ether wallet, wallet. Because you, hi, you hijack the name. So this is different than the other thing where it was a typo thing. This is actually the actual name because you have a hijacked the lookup is, yeah, is this one. Even is sneakier, much sneakier. Um, is there another question over here? No. Um, so this is what happened. You uh, take that DNS request and you respond to it yourself because you have advertised a more specific route to Route 53. And then this gets passed back to the client and the client then redirects to this fake website in Russia. Um, is the, that's the exploit. So that's, a, that's what happened. You can read a little bit more about this at this blog post, which is where I uh, borrowed these uh, images from. Um, I don't know, <laughs> vigilant, uh, vigilant network operators to catch this and immediately try and shut this down. But like, um, law, like so here's the problem. This could, th like you would have to work with law enforcement in Russia <laughs> to say, hey, stop your people from doing it. Like that's not gonna work. 
least not from us. Well, wait, maybe maybe from us now, <laughs> since we're best buddies with them. Maybe they would prosecute the uh, <laughs> those folks. I don't know. But you, this is where multi-jurisdictional issues on the internet, ha like you, you need some way. It's really hard to turn the crank because a lot of people don't even know what's going on. Like they're not technical enough to think that this is actually a problem. And so they have to care enough about this problem to go after their own people in their own country to capture, like, like, but they, why would they even bother expending the resources to catch someone that's doing this? Because as far as they're concerned, this is part of their GDP. They got money. <laughs> they got money from some other people's wallet and they've turned a profit. That's actually good for, well, in North Korea, that would be good. That's seen as, as very beneficial, right? Because they have no way to get money. So this is actually a perfect way. And this is what North Korea is definitely going after crypto wallets hard, uh, to do this. So. That's, that's how they are circumventing sanctions, is to get cryptocurrency and try and monetize that. So it's a surprise that this came out of Russia, not, uh, not North Korea. Yeah. So while this was happening, the clients had no way to actually reach the US. The clients had no way. At the, while this thing was hijacked, and then DNS entries are cached. So yeah, you had this bogus entry in the DNS hierarchy for a little while. Yes, yeah, so if you had an original mapping, yeah, so if you knew what that mapping was legitimately, and then you got this new mapping, uh, then you would be able to tell, yeah. And hopefully the original IAC wallet would see this, but no one's used their site today. Aha, yeah, yeah, if they have good site reliability engineers, they'll be like, hey, something's, I got no requests in the last minute, send me something, but even then, at that point, what can they do about it? Right. You know, they, the, by the time they can actually do something about it, it the, yeah, we've got a bunch of people who've already gone to that site. So, yeah. Okay, so one of the ways to prevent this, and this is something that uh, uh, it's seen very slow adoption until recently. Yep. An even more specific route. Yes, you could do that. But that like defeats the purpose of route aggregation. Like I could advertise every single IP address in my range and then completely blow up the internet with the, the route, the, the number of routes uh, that are there. Yeah, yeah, that's also a problem. Uh, so one way you can prevent this is using DNSSEC. And uh, this uh, was slow to get adopted, but I think it's getting a little bit uh, more widespread with stuff like this happening. Um, and this is basically certificates for DNS records. If you go to Google and you have them manage your domain, it's a nice little click button, right? So that's part of the reason that you would want to, like, I don't want to set up DNS certificates. Like, I, don't, I don't like security that much. Uh, so then this is unfortunately not checked by browsers a lot because it's easy to get this wrong. And the last thing you want to do is uh, force a content provider to get like, to turn all of its users away because you got something wrong. Um, but this is this is on the horizon. Like you would want to look at this if you had an e-commerce site, just to make sure you're, someone's not hijacking all of your users with uh, DNS poisoning. Okay, another a big issue, actually, within the last week or two, this is an enormous issue. Is uh, the queries aren't encrypted? All of that stuff goes in the clear. So poisoning is bad. But like uh, but another issue is that people can see every single DNS request that you have. Uh, so an adversary on this network, so you have the resolver and any t anywhere between you and the local DNS server that's going to re respond to your query, anywhere along the way you can see the names. Uh, everyone can see those names. Um, and so the idea, there are two proposals for addressing this. Uh, the first is to just use DNS over HTTPS. So HTTPS is secure, I'll just c communicate with my DNS server using HTTPS. Uh, and so this will secure your connection between the resolving, uh, which is on your laptop or your local uh, machine to the local name server. Uh, and then this basically encrypts the payload and then it removes any man in the middle attack. So nobody on an open wireless network can then say google.com is me. So that, that's, it's both integrity and privacy at the same time. Um, and this is working its way through IATF as dope. <laughs> which is a, the, like the coolest protocol acronym uh, I could imagine, if you're a Simpsons fan at least. Um, so this is uh, DOH, and then this is the interface. I would just curl from my local DNS server 
the name uh, that I'm looking for, and then it would send me back JSON, which is the de facto data format that's being sent back and forth between client and server. And then you would get all your answers, and then this thing is encrypted, right? You could actually do this now uh, in your command line. Nobody knows what that, that like nobody between the, the resolver and the local DNS server can then see both the query or the response, which is what you want. Uh, but this begs the question is, uh, why not do DNS over TLS directly? Why do I have to put it over HTTP? So we have port 80, which is clear HTTP, and then we have port 443, which is HTTP over TLS. We have clear DNS, which is port 53. Uh, we should have a encrypted DNS over TLS, and that's what dot is, DNS over TLS. So you want to, so in, in, the, in the previous, you're conflating web requests with DNS requests. Here, you're separating that out. Now, is this good or bad? Like, what would be a good thing? I mean. Would anyone think that this was bad to keep them separate? So this is, uh, this is what I was referring to. This past week, uh, there are, this is a tension between the network operators and the civil, civil liberties folks. So this is where the non-technical people come out. Uh, so the DOT allows the network operators to do this segregation. And then because they can segregate the traffic, they can analyze the traffic for bad behavior and then be able to, to, to filter bad traffic out. Now, what happens if that traffic is for activists? Say you're a government and you want to track DOT for stuff that you don't want. Your bad actor are people who are trying to like, you know, message out to the world what's going on. So that is the, that is the reason why a lot of people want it over HTTPS. So this prevents a hostile government from blocking encrypted DNS requests. Because it's really easy to say, I'm going to start filtering 853 in its entirety. But you're not going to sit there and filter HTTPS. Because HTTPS is basically, that's what everything is running, right? So you're conflating the two in order to hide this critical traffic inside of something that will never get uh, banned. So that's the argument. Uh, so network operators want the the pure solution, and then uh, a lot of other people don't. So um, it's an interesting, this is a, an article that you can click on. Yeah, that's just from last week, basically. So that's all I'm going to talk about with DNS. Are there questions before I do uh, CDNs, content distribution networks? So I'll give you a five-minute break, and then we'll, we'll start with CDNs.